I want to preface this section and say that I'm going to use a lot of terminology and things that you may not understand right now, but that's okay. A lot of the things that I'm going to talk about, you will understand because they're very basic down to the fundamentals. But some of them, I'm going to talk about the ins and outs of how .NET works, and that's going to require me to talk a little bit more in depth about how uh, types work in C Sharp. So if you don't understand things, just know that later on when you learn about classes and inheritance, you'll be able to come back to this lecture, watch it again, and maybe get a little bit more out of it. So let's go ahead and dive into value types. So when we were talking about the common type system, we were talking about the fact that there are these two types of types. Um, I wanted to say classes of types, but you know, that's another word that is kind of weird. But there's these two types of types, reference types and value types. Now, if you think of system.object, it's actually a reference type itself, but then it has some subclasses of it that determine uh, value types, enums, and structs. So all of the primitive or built-in types that we have that are numeric in value are uh, actually structs. And we're gonna talk about these really quickly and go through all the different ones that they are. They're all on the screen right here. All the different value types that you will ever have that are not user defined are on the screen right now. We're gonna go through each one of them really quickly and talk about what they are. Now, the first few types that we have on here are all numeric in value. Even the Boolean is numeric if you think about it because how does a computer think? It only thinks in zeros and ones. And a Boolean value is either true or false. So if it's true, it's a one. If it's false, if it's, it's a zero. And then at the end of the day, how is all this stored? It's stored in bits and bytes. Well, we have these byte and uh, signed byte data types. So there's a couple times I'm gonna talk in here about signed and unsigned, and I wanna explain that real quick. Uh, signed and unsigned just means whether it can be negative or if it's only positive essentially. So a byte by itself is assumed to be just positive, but we can have a signed byte as well. So when we have a byte that's not signed, that gives us an extra bit that we can work with because there's this one bit that says it's either negative or positive in a signed byte. We don't have to use that for that because we know it's always going to be positive and it allows us to get more use out of it on the positive side of what it can store. Now, it can go up to 255 because a byte has eight bits in it. You'll see that I have eight ones here. So we can start a byte with zero B and I can say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now a signed byte can only have seven possible uh, bits that are filled. And the first one can either be negative or not. We can't put a one here. That'll make it think that it's an extra bit, but if you put a zero, it knows that you mean that you want to have a negative number. So it can be two, the byte can be 255. The signed byte can be a range from negative 128 to 127. Now, you're not going to use this a whole lot unless you're doing some really low level programming type stuff, which if you're new, you're not going to do that anytime soon. So don't get too hung up on this. I wouldn't go studying binary anytime soon. Uh, but just letting you know that these data types are there, they are value types. Now, Another one that you'll use is the character type. Now this looks on the surface like it may not be a number, but really this is just one character. So it's not a string. I can't put more things in here. I can't say Alice, right? Because a character can only be, you'll see that little red squiggly came up there. A character can only be one single character. And when we only have one single character, we got to represent that using a number or a byte system. Uh, and all the characters are actually in Unicode. And you can store, and it's a 16-bit uh, Unicode character, so two bytes. And uh, it can store any of those characters just one at a time. So it's still kind of like a number value. Uh, then we have some of our floating point numbers. Now, if you're used to JavaScript or some dynamic languages like that where you don't have decimals and floats and doubles, then this is going to be really foreign to you. And it's going to be really disturbing at first because floats and doubles don't add, subtract, divide, multiply the way that we think about it as humans, how we add, subtract, multiply. Um, 
it actually does its storage of the numbers in sort of like scientific notation. Now, I'm going to do a whole video on how floats and doubles work and why sometimes when you do a calculation, you may not get the result that you expected. So if you're going to work with money and numbers or anything like that, make sure that you use a decimal. Now, what I have in here is the maximum values of each of these uh, types. So a decimal can be 7.9 to times 10 to the 28th. So when I put this E here, it's like scientific notation. And then I have to put the M here to say that it's a decimal. Otherwise, it'll automatically try to convert that into a double. Same here with the F. This just says that this is a float. But the float uh, can be much bigger than a decimal. Uh, to 30, 10 to the 38th, and then a double can be much, much bigger than that, uh, 1.7 times 10 to the 308th. And working with these large numbers is the reason that sometimes calculations can be off by fractions uh, where you would expect them to be right. But if you use decimal, that's something that's been created in higher level languages to make sure that when you calculate uh, when you do calculations with decimals that you actually get what you expect in a base 10 format, which as humans we think in base 10, whereas 0.1 is 1 tenth, 0 0.01 is 1 one hundredth. Computers don't actually think like that. 0.1 to them is 1 half, uh, 0.11 to them is 1 quarter. Um, so you got to kind of think of it a little bit differently and see that it's going to come out um, the way that you want it to if you use decimal versus if you use float and double. Now, we use float and double for calculations that are very big or very small, so like quantum physics or astrophysics. So how far is our galaxy from Andromeda? Well, we would need to use very big numbers to figure that out, right? So that's why computers use this notation. We don't want to make that calculation and have to use gigs and gigs of data just to do it. And this way, that we uh, store them in floats and doubles allows us to avoid that. Now, more commonly used number formats will be integers, uh, long, shorts, really just, you're probably going to use integer just by default most of the time. Most of the examples that you're going to see are going to just use an integer. Uh, the main thing you need to know about an integer is that it can't store decimals. So if you do 1.5 times 2.5, it's going to round up. It'll still do it for you, but it's going to round um, based on, you know, the, uh, the value that would have come out of that. Uh, an integer is, can store this maximum value, uh, and it can be positive or negative. And then we have unsigned integers that only go in the positive direction. So you'll see that the unsigned values are always bigger, per se, than the signed values. But really, the range is the same. It's just that it goes between a negative number and a positive number. Um, so these are all of the number data types that you'll work with. And there's another type that's very similar to a number type, which is an enum. Now, an enum just gives us a way to represent a number in a different way. Don't overthink this. But imagine that I'm going to share something this, with, with you, and it's like this RGB enum. And I know that internally, when you pass this to me, I need to know that red is the number one, blue is the number three, green is the number two. Well, in that case, I want to be able to pass it around from my side as just red. I don't want to remember that red is one, blue is three, and green is two. So that's why we use enums. And down here, I've got an example of how this works. So really, this is still just the number one. It's just being represented in our code as red. Now, the other one that we have is a struct. Now, the struct is potentially the most confusing of the value types that we're going to talk about because it looks a heck of a lot like a class. And there are some key differences. For one, all of these different things up here are actually structs. Um, but structs cannot be inherited from. So, you know, whenever we uh, create a class, we can share that with somebody and they can inherit from that class. A struct cannot be inherited from. Also, structs are a value type, and classes are not value types. And there's one key difference between value and reference types that can really get you in trouble that you really need to understand right now. You'll see that the way that we assign these literal values to, um, you know, like a decimal, an int, whatever, is that we assign it this value. We're not necessarily having to instantiate this object or anything like that. That's because these variables hold the data in the memory 
where whenever you initiate that value, right? And so it references its actual value, whereas a class references a place in memory where its object is stored. So if I say int i equals one and int z equals i, it actually creates a copy of that value into z. So now I have that variable twice in memory. Now, when we're talking about these numbers, it's not necessarily that big of a deal because they're relatively small to store. But objects would be huge if we were doing this all the time. So we store references. So if I say object A equals object B, then it's also gonna store a reference to that object. And that variable is actually pointing to the exact same object in each case. Now we can use structs to where it acts more like a value type. It is a value type. Whereas when we assign them to each other, it actually copies all those values out. Now, to get a little bit deeper into how .NET works and the framework, is that this also means that garbage collection doesn't have to run on value types. And garbage collection is this thing that comes around while your code is running and decides when it should pull things out of memory and when it shouldn't. And the way that it does that is knowing, is there, for a reference type, it's really hard because it's looking for all of the different references to that object in memory. So it sees this object in memory and says, can any code that is currently running be able to access this object still? If it can't, I need to get rid of it so I clear up some memory. With value types, it doesn't have to worry about that. As soon as a variable is gone, it knows that that value can never be accessed again and it can just kill it. Um, but for garbage collection and reference types, it's a different. And we really need to understand this difference so that we don't have unintended consequences as we're uh, working in our code where we're assigning variables, thinking we're changing one thing, but really we're not changing that variable. We've got a new copy of it. So if you assign at any value type to another variable, you're getting a copy of that variable. Very important. That is the main thing you want to know about value types so that you don't think that you're getting this reference and doing something with it and then it's going to change that other variable as well that could really get you in trouble when you're writing your code. And we're gonna look at some examples once we talk about reference types. We'll have another video where we show examples of uh, value types and reference types and some of those gotchas that you could run into. So now let's go ahead and jump over and talk about reference types.